Hey there, my name is Nathan Agin. This is The Working Actor's Journey, bringing you in-depth conversations with actors that have been working professionally for decades. Today, we have a text work session with Ray Porter from episode number 16. Previous sessions of text work include Shakespeare, Pinter, Stoppard, and newer works. And if you enjoy this text work session, I highly encourage you to check out the full episode with the guest, as they are packed with just so much candor, honesty, wisdom, and ideas on life as a working actor. They are fantastic conversations. And along with all those episodes is the guide, 12 Top Acting Tips from Season 1. I've put this together from the over 19 hours of content from Season 1, and it contains great quotes and ideas from all the guests about pursuing an acting career. You can grab your free copy at workingactorsjourney.com slash sign up. So go get that right now. That link is also in the show notes and episode description. Check out these fantastic acting tips at workingactorsjourney.com slash sign up. In this episode, Ray will be discussing a speech from John Webster's The White Devil, which is a Jacobean play and comes in the period right after Shakespeare. As Ray shared, plays in this period were much darker and a definite departure from many of the themes you'd see in Shakespeare's work. It's not a play I was familiar with and really glad these guests are introducing us to other classical works. As I mentioned in the complete episode with Ray, this may be a great play for you to find a lesser-known monologue for your auditions. You'll hear Ray discuss why this speech fascinates him, how language was the CGI of the day, and why classical theater and plays like this are still so relevant today. It's a great session and a wonderful discussion about theater, politics, and acting. So here we go with Ray and the White Devil. Please enjoy the text work. Actually, it kind of leads into taking a quick look at a piece of text and talking a little bit about your process. You had mentioned it was a play by John Webster. Yes. It's called The White Devil, John Webster. He's uh, one of the playwrights that came after Shakespeare, what's called Jacobean playwriting, which is a real different style than, you know, Shakespeare... I find in every one of Shakespeare's plays at some point, either it's the overarching theme or sometimes it's just in a moment, there's this concept of like weighing mercy versus justice. There's the fallibility of humanity and what is that which connects us to the eternal? You know what? Uh, uh, you know, there's all of these like um Jacobean theater is not that. It's real sensual. It's real bloody. It's very, you know, it, it's uh, it's fascinating as an answer to what came before. Hmm. And yet, you know, the linguistic constraints are still there. The poetic device is still there, and and the you know the language still flows in that way. It's just the subject matter is oftentimes a lot more brutal and kind of um, it's just darker. It's just it's just harsher in a lot of ways. Than Shakespeare is. Okay, cool. Um, I mean, a crude analogy would be like, you know, Shakespeare is talking about the heart and the soul. Jacobean theater is talking a lot about tits. <laughs> so, you know, Got it. terrible analogy, but you know, <laughs> kind of like that. All right, cool. So, so you have this uh, speech by it's Francisco. Francisco's the character and essentially what's going on, um, without going into the, you know, the whole like story of it or whatever, there's, um, this issue with the, the main sort of woman in the show, a woman named Vittoria, who is incredibly smart and doesn't miss a trick, is, is smarter than most of the men around her, much more competent than most of the men around her. And she is brought low by this, sort of group of guys who are, you know, trumping up charges against her and hitting her with all kinds of allegations. And uh, sound familiar at all? Yeah. Yeah. This speech is basically Francisco is trying to convince 
Camillo, Vittoria's husband, that it's best that she be scrutinized in this way. You know, it's basically just trying to get the husband on board. Okay. With this challenge. Okay. And appropriately enough, it starts with an analogy. <laughs> Go figure. But yeah, I, I like, I like the speech because of a lot of the imagery in it, but because the imagery in it has very little to do with what exactly is the point of it. Okay. It's a little like, it's a little like the archbishops talking together before Henry V walks in the room. How are we going to convince him to go to war with France? Right. Well, okay. So just to give people a little context, I'll read a few lines so that they can start to, you know, get, get a sense and you can kind of walk us through maybe some of the questions you'd ask yourself or how you'd go into it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, Francisco says an old tale upon a time, Phoebus, the God of light or him we call the sun would need to be married. The gods gave their consent and Mercury was sent to voice it to the general world. But what a piteous cry there straight arose amongst smiths and felt makers, brewers and cooks, reapers and butter women, amongst fishmongers and thousand other trades, which are annoyed by his excessive heat. Twas lamentable. All right. So I'll just kind of pause there. And, um, yeah, th- that's the, the metaphor you're, you're, you're uh, alluding to. Yeah, I, it is, but it's interesting because there's, you know, what's, what's sort of, you know, said in that. And <laughs> again, the reason why it seems to be clanging real hard with the news lately is basically it's saying, you know, like Phoebus, the god of light wanted to get married and the god said, that's fine. And Mercury went and announced it to the world, but everybody came and said, no, 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 this is bad for business. Mm. This is bad for business. You know, this is, you know, if you do that, it's going to affect me in this very negative way. And, it's a great sort of concise, these are all trades that would be affected by the heat and everything. And he's trying to make it as clean as he can for Camillo. Right. To try to convince him, you know? So, I mean, I think the first part of that is pretty straightforward. I don't see, you know, it's kind of an Aesop's fable kind of thing. Right. Do you know what I mean? And I didn't, I didn't scan it, but it, it, so does Jacobean, do they kind of adhere to the iambic pentameter or is it a different? Well, rhythm? there's, there's all kinds of rhetorical devices. There's litoti, spondi, there's trochaics, there's, you know, okay. it's all of the, it's all of the sort of mathematical textual devices that was in fashion at the time, sure. you know, for, for playwrights. I mean, we have to remember that. What our CGI is now was language for them. Yeah. You know, oh, my God, did you see what he did with that rhetorical device is literally the same as, dude, when that dinosaur came out of the wall, it's the same thing. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You didn't go see a play. You went to hear a play, which is why it's called an auditorium. Right. Not a visitorium. (laughs) You know, it was it was so much about sound and about language. So, yeah, they definitely stayed with that. Okay, cool. Um, so are there any, uh, any other items or, you know, things that pop up for you in this speech that you want to kind of highlight in terms of, you know, things that stand out for you or, or ways you'd, you'd get into it a little bit deeper? Well, this is all leading into the argument. This is the parable prior to the, to the actual lesson. Upon a time, Phoebus, the god of light, or him we call the sun, would need to be married. Gods gave their consent. Mercury was sent to voice it to the general world. But what a piteous cry there straight arose amongst smiths and felt makers, brewers and cooks, reapers and butter women, amongst fishmongers and thousand other trades which are annoyed by his excessive heat. Twas lamentable. They came to Jupiter all in a sweat and do forbid the bands. A great fat cook was made their speaker, who entreats of Jove that Phoebus might be gelded. For if now, when there was but one son, so many men were like to perish by his violent heat, what should they do if he were married and should beget more, and those children make fireworks like their father? So say I. Only I apply it to your wife. Her issue, should not providence prevent it, would make both nature, time, and man repent it. It's interesting. It's like she cannot be allowed to breed, but he never actually says why. Right. Do you know? It's not, I mean, she's not going to burn the earth like Phoebus would if suddenly we were faced with, you know, three or four sons. So 
what the hell is Francisco actually doing here? I mean, it's a flimsy argument if you really look at it that way. Camillo's jealous. He's worried. You know, there's all of this stuff. I mean, they're just, it's, it's this very, very subtle attack. This is a recurring theme in, uh, in the white devil. It's very entertaining as well. There's a scene where one of the guys, uh, they've, they've given him a poisoned helmet. They've treated the inside of his war helmet with poison that will kill him. Oh, wow. Uh, and, and then so he comes in and he's in agony and he's on the bed and they bring in two priests to hear his final confession and to grant him absolution. And everybody leaves except for the two priests and Bracciano, the character who's poisoned in the bed. And it turns out that the priests are actually these two guys in disguise who know him really well and do everything they can to make him despair before he dies, because that will ensure he goes to hell rather than heaven. Wow. So, you know, it's a lot of this like sort of subtle Machiavellian, if you will, you know, machinations uh, around it. Right. This bit of this bit of text I like because it, it's such a question mark. There's this, you know, wonderful illustrative parable. It's pretty clear. It's pretty easy to understand. The guy, you know, the guy who makes cheese goes to the gods and says, if there's two sons, my cheese will all melt. There's nothing, you know, come on. Right. You can't do this. I'm not going to be able to live. I'll die. Never mind the fact that we're going to be burned. It's going to be terrible for the environment and everything. I'm not going to be able to make any money. But literally what he's saying in this thing is this brilliant story about the sun and the world. And it's this great fable and the reapers and butter women and all of that. And that's why you shouldn't let your wife fuck. Right. What? <laughs> Do you know? <laughs> which which uh, also uh, makes it quite a timely piece that, you know, you Well, have, that it you certainly have, does. Yeah, it's you certainly, have, you know. Yeah, you have people making arguments that it's like, well, 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 wait a second. That doesn't track. Oh, no, no, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. They make these like they make these incredibly impassioned speeches, but if you actually stand outside and listen to it, you're like, "What? <laughs> I don't have enough breadcrumbs to get home. This makes no sense." Yeah. Um, I'm going back to the Anita Hill thing. I remember when Senator Orrin Hatch uh-huh. quoted Shakespeare to Anita Hill. He who steals my goods steals my trash, but he who steals my reputation. And it was this big sweeping gesture. And all the conservatives were like, yeah, that's great. Until somebody went, you know, that's Yago's speech, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, um, it's uh, it's interesting. I mean, I, I'm reminded constantly, certainly with current events and and even, you know, with a play like The White Devil, um, Tullus Aphidius in the play Coriolanus right. is such a great uh, speech, you know, when he feels like Coriolanus is starting to get out of hand and all of that. And there's that line. So our virtues lie in the interpretation of the time. Hmm. You know, it's a lot about jealousy. It's like, why is he a hero? And I'm not right. You know, and, and all of that. It's, um, it's fascinating. Nothing really changes, does it? Right. You know? Yeah. There's, I think there's an incredible amount of comedy, depending on how you play this. And if you wanted to, you could certainly mine the comedy, sure. um, sure. out of this speech. You know, there's this huge, wonderful fable and everything. And, you know, so say I, only I apply it to your wife. Wait, what? Yeah. You know, yeah. and then there's no further argument. There's just a couplet at the end. Like that's going to be enough. Interesting. Yeah. No, and and the point you made about you know the the virtues and interpretation, it, right? It's I mean often they kind of say the the winners write the history and and that kind of thing. Well, yes. Um, but yeah, it is it is very interesting to like kind of think about Shakespeare having that same knowing about that same concept and and we're still seeing it 400 plus years yeah depressingly nothing really changes but this is why (laughs) i'm sorry you can make a really solid case for doing classical theater in 2018 america right Right. um but the trick is you know just just deliver the damn mail the you know people are smart they'll get it yeah um how many times have you sat and watched some speech given by a politician lately and thought, how on earth are these people actually accepting this or believing it? Why is no one rushing the stage? Why aren't there pitchforks? What, does nobody see the madness of this? Right. And nobody really does. Go back and look at some of these, uh, some of these early plays. 
Yeah. Go back and have a look at, you know, the white devil. Go back and have a look at, uh, measure for measure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it's all there. Nothing changes. The clothes do and maybe the way we arrange words, but it's all there. Hey guys, Nathan here one more time. If you enjoyed this episode, please remember to subscribe so you don't miss anything ahead. Be sure to visit WorkingActorsJourney.com for additional info and links for items mentioned in today's episode, as well as all the episodes. You can follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. All the links are on our site and in the episode notes. Become a premium member and enjoy additional benefits and perks of the show starting at just $2 per month. Head over to WorkingActorsJourney.com slash premium to join the Working Actors community. Thanks again to today's guest and to everyone that makes these episodes possible. And a special thanks to you for listening. I'm Nathan Agan, and enjoy the journey.